Good afternoon. It is the 7th of June. It's about 2.45 in the afternoon, and we're going to get started with our first of two lectures for this week. And this one is called the American Revolution. But we're not going to jump straight into the American Revolution. We're actually going to talk about something called the Seven Years' War and go over what happens leading up to the Revolution. And the Seven Years' War is going to be a war that lasts from 1756 to 1763. It is a European war that is going to spill out and over into the colonies. And it's really France and England, and they're having a fight around the world. There's fighting in Africa, Europe, Asia, uh, in India, you name it. But here in the United States, we know it better as the French and Indian War, because the French and their Native American allies are going to fight the United States, well, the British colonies and the British allies as well. Now this war is going to start when both England and France are going to claim the part of North America that is today Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. And France begins to build a bunch of forts to make their claim. And England, under the command of the governor of Virginia, is going to march an army to go and try and stop these forts from being built. Well. One of the people who is involved in stopping the French from building the forts is a guy named George Washington. Well, George Washington and his commanding officer, Edward Braddock, discover that forts are being made. They start to fight with the French. A French commander or a couple of French soldiers are going to be taken captive, and then war is going to break out. Now, the North American part of the fighting only lasts until 1760, uh, but the fighting is going to continue in other parts of the world. And we do have the British and their Native American allies fighting the French and their Native American allies. The, the Austrians get involved in this. The Spanish get involved in this. There's, it, it truly is a world war. Uh, here in North America, the British do very well. They are going to capture pretty much every French city and French uh, fort that you can think of. Fort Detroit, they're going to take St. Louis, they're going to take Quebec, you name it. Well, by the time we get to 1763, the war is coming to a close, and the French and the English are going to sign a peace treaty, and this is known as the Peace of Paris 1763. In the Peace of Paris 1763, France gives up control of India and France gives up control of North America as well. So the Peace of Paris, 1763, is very much how the British get control of Canada. Now, what are the overall impacts of the war? Well, one of the things that you had to read about already is the Proclamation of 1763. The Proclamation of 1763 is going to ban any settlers from going west of the Appalachian Mountains and that makes the American people very, very angry. And that's because um, the colonists thought that they fought for the land between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains. They thought they deserved it. They thought they should, should get it. And the British monarchy and the British Parliament says, no, you can't have it. The other thing that's really, really bad about the Proclamation of 1763 is just the English colonists realized that they weren't treated the same. They feel like they were treated very, very poorly. It's really during the Seven Years' War that the British colonists here in America realize that they're being treated differently. They're not being respected. They're not being treated to the same quality or the same standards. When it was time to fight, they weren't given um, equipment that was as good. They weren't given supplies that were as good, and it's really going to start a chain reaction there. The other big impact of the Seven Years' War is quite simply the fact that the French are no longer in North America, so it's going to be a one-trick pony. There's going to be one group in charge, and that's going to become the British, and the Native Americans are going to lose a lot of bargaining power because of this. Now, this slide here, it says colonial resistance to the British Empire, and this is very much going to be a result of money. The 
British Crown and the British Parliament, they decide that because the war actually started in North America, that the American colonists should pay the majority of the war cost. Now, King George III, who is king at this point in time in England, uh, he's going to appoint a guy named Lord Grenville to be the prime minister. And Lord Grenville's job is to figure out how much the war cost and how much the colonists should pay. And it turns out that they want the colonists to pay for the majority of the war cost. So in 1763, Lord Grenville is going to pass the Sugar Act and the Currency Act of 1764. Now, the Sugar Act, its primary job is to stop sugar and molasses from other countries being brought into the colonies. And the only sugar allowed in, the only molasses allowed in, had to have a tax paid on it to the British government. The Currency Act made it so that only British money could be used. Uh, no colonial money, no foreign money, money, nothing like that. Only money that could be used is that of the British crown or the British government. At the same time this is happening, there's a group in England, uh, specifically Northern England, known as the Real Whigs. And the real Whigs are going to go around talking and, and speaking about how the king was corrupt, the government was corrupt, and that money was being stolen from the people. And that's basically exactly what the American colonists wanted to hear. When some of these real Whigs make it to the American side of the ocean, then this real Whig movement is going to take off and become a really, really big thing. Now, to protest the Sugar Act and the Currency Act, um, a group is going to be formed to kind of run a protest. And this group is going to get even stronger when the Stamp Act is passed in 1765. And what the Stamp Act of 1765 does is it requires a stamp to be put on any ma printed material. So newspapers, deeds, um, playing cards, anything that had paper involving in it had to have a stamp on it showing that you paid an extra tax. And very much this is going to affect the upper class, the bankers, the lawyers, the politicians, things like that. And very famously, James Otis Jr. He's a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. He is going to declare that the Stamp Act is, is illegal and come up with the phrase, taxation without representation is tyranny. We know that phrase, taxation without representation is, is a fury. Ugh, let me start over. Taxation without representation is tyranny. We know that phrase better today as no taxation without representation. Um, the group that's founded, by the way, after all this, is called the Sons of Liberty. And the Sons of Liberty is going to be those doctors and those lawyers and those bankers, the ones who were affected by all of these past taxes. And they decide to resist and boycott British goods. Uh, a group known as the Stamp Act Congress is going to meet, and they're going to write a sternly worded letter to Parliament demanding that all of these taxes be put away and stopped. Well, the Stamp Act Congress, they do write the letter. The letter gets to Parliament in London, and the Stamp Act is going to be repealed by a guy named Lord Rockingham. Now, what Lord Rockingham is going to do, he's going to have Parliament pass something called the Declaratory Acts. And the 1766 Declaratory Act basically says that the British government can do whatever they want to the American colonies whenever they want to. And basically reasserts their, their foothold on it and, and reclaims the colonies as English territory. In 1767, there's yet another prime minister. Uh, this one is William Pitt. Uh, William Pitt is tasked with the job of verifying whether the colonists have paid their money or not. So William Pitt is going to appoint a new head of the exchequer, basically a new head of the treasury, whose name is Charles Townsend. And Charles Townsend, he goes through the books, he audits the amount that the colonists owes, and he realizes that the colonists have never paid everything that they are supposed to. 
So Charles Townsend get some new taxes passed that are meant to uh, pay off the bill. And these Townsend Acts, as they become known, their goal was to raise enough money so that the colonists pay for the government in the colonies. So the Townsend Acts, they're going to pack, put a tax on just about everything. Import goods, export goods, stuff that comes from France, Spain, even things that come from Great Britain are suddenly going to be subject to these taxes. And the colonists go nuts over this. Uh, the best known protest is going to be the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. Um, the Boston Massacre happens in the year 1770, and it happens in the winter of 1770, early spring, whatever you want to call it. And basically, uh, there's a group of Boston citizens, Bostonians, I think is what they're called, who are protesting the British soldiers who they think are taking their jobs. At this point in time, being a soldier was not a 24-7 thing. You were a soldier during the day, and then you could take other jobs when you were off. And the soldiers were taking jobs from people living in Boston. And so on one Friday in March 1770, some people meet, and they start to throw snowballs at the soldiers. And then on the Monday, they show up again, and they start throwing snowballs again. But this time, somebody is putting... Um, rocks inside the, the snowballs. And before you know it, the protesters are being shot by the British Army. Sam Adams and John Adams, who go on to be founding fathers, uh, their first job was to be lawyers. They were involved in, in uh, legal proceedings. And they actually represented the soldiers and were able to prove that soldiers did nothing wrong. But the news was out, and the story coming out of Boston was very different than what the actual uh, situation was. Once the news of these villainous British soldiers firing on these innocent Boston citizens, even though we know that's not what really happened, suddenly, you know, people are getting really, really, really mad, and that whole real wig view of the the crown being corrupt and the king being corrupt and all of this, it really catches on. In 1773, we have the Boston Tea Party. Now, the Boston Tea Party, it's going to happen because the Tea Act is passed in 1773, and the whole purpose of the Tea Act was to keep the British East India Trading Company in business. This was the original company that was too big to fail. It was the British East Company that did all the trading for the British Empire. The British East India Trading Company actually ran India as its own colony. And if this company went bankrupt, it would have destroyed the British. So the Tea Act, its entire job was to pass a tax that kept the British East India Company in power and in business. It'd be like um, if anywhere you shop, there was an extra tax added to keep Apple in business. That's basically what they were doing. The result was in the middle of the night, a couple dozen people dressed up like Seneca, or I think it was, yeah, it was Seneca Native Americans. They got onto a couple of ships belonging to the British East India Company, and they start throwing bricks of tea into Boston Harbor. And at the time, tea didn't come in little tea bags. Uh, tea came in these, these bricks, and you were supposed to, to chisel a little bit of tea off the brick and then put that in your water. Well, they threw thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of tea into the, the Boston Harbor. By the time we get to 1773 and 1774, um, there are some people who are really declaring and calling for something to change. And in September 1774, the first Continental Congress meets. And the first Continental Congress is going to put together something known as the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. Basically, this is a letter that's going to be sent to the king and a letter that's going to be sent to Parliament that says the colonists would obey, quote, bona fide acts of Parliament. 
Problem is, nobody really knows what a bona fide act of parliament was. Uh, long story short, what the colonists wanted was some sort of recognition and some sort of self-control. At the same time this is happening, some militiamen are gathering weapons and supplies. And word gets out that one of the places that that weapons were being captured and controlled and gathered was in Concord, Massachusetts. A British general named Thomas Gage is ordered by the, the um, Secretary of State for American Affairs, that's the fancy term for the, the Crown's representative in the colonies, uh, the Secretary of State ordered Thomas Gage to locate the mob leaders, arrest anybody involved, and to capture the weapons. So this British army is going to march out of Boston, and they get as far as Lex Lexington Square when a group of American militiamen are going to fire on the soldiers. The militia is beaten, and a couple of very famous people take a midnight ride. Paul Revere and, let's see, there's Paul Revere, William Dawes, and Samuel Prescott. Those are the three guys that do the midnight ride. However, Paul Revere is the most famous, and if you're curious why, it's because he was the one with the most money, he was the one with the most status. And Revere and Dawes are the ones who are caught or stopped, and Samuel Prescott, the one we, nobody ever knows about, who's the one was, that was successful. Uh, once word gets out, by the night of May 20th, there are over 20,000 American militiamen who are surrounding Boston just waiting for a break and waiting for a reason to start fighting the British. So this whole idea of revolution, it wasn't really pre-planned. It was something that just came upon the spot. It's something that's just going to naturally happen because of all of these negative things that occur in the decade from really 1763 to 1773. Um, even as late as 1775, there were ways to stop this if people had listened. But by the time we get to 70, 1774, 1775, uh, nobody wants to listen anymore. And a revolution is about to begin. But that revolution is in the next video. So you'll have to watch the next video to learn what happens. Uh, we'll see you next time. Talk to you later.